You're going to like this chapter. I don't think there's a single calculation in it. It's all words. So it'll go pretty quickly. You really don't need much help from me. We're going to talk about what the functions of money are, what comprises our money supply, and what backs it. And then we're going to spend some time talking about what the Federal Reserve is and what its functions are. So we're going to start out talking about the three functions of money. So the first function of money is medium of exchange. Medium of exchange just talks about your use of money to buy stuff. So when you get paid, a certain amount of your money is going to be used for a medium of exchange. But some of your money might be saved in order to use later. And that's what store value is. For something to be used as money, it has to be acceptable right now for us to go to the grocery store and spend and buy the groceries that we want. But it also has to be acceptable later. It has to hold its value so I could put it in a savings account and use it later. So when you think about what can and can't be used of money, you remember from reading history classes or watching old movies that gold was used as money. Yes, we could weigh it out right now and go to the general store and buy what we wanted, but we could also store it away and use it later. So it met those two functions of money. I left unit of count last simply because it's harder to understand. So unit of count just gives us a common price system, a way to understand how much something costs. If we were trying to do it with barter and we were forever trying to figure out how many loaves of bread equaled a T-bone steak or whatever, it could to be very difficult. What if we didn't have loaves of bread to trade for the steak? What if we had potatoes or something? It would be hard to value. So when we use money, something besides an actual barter, instead of trading good for good, but instead of fiat money, that money serves as a way to establish the price of something that we can all understand, regardless of what we have to trade. So when I tell you that something costs $5 or something costs $5,000, you know immediately the relative difference in those prices. That's what a unit of account is. It just values goods and services in terms of that currency. So when we talk about money and the rest of this class, we are always going to be focused on M1 money. This is the only definition of money we use, and that's cool because it's really easy to calculate. So M1 money only has two things in it. It has currency and checkable deposit. So currency is the money in our pockets. It's just the actual dollar bills or coins that we um, have in our possession that we use to buy stuff with. Whereas checkable deposits is the money in our checking accounts. So when we say checkable deposits, just think the money in your checking account. It doesn't matter who, who holds your checking account, commercial bank, savings and loan, credit union, whatever. It's just the money in your checking account. Notice it's not the money in your savings account. The reason for that is M1 money is the most liquid form of money. So when I say something is liquid, it means it can, how fast it can be converted to cash. So money in your checking account is the most liquid form. I mean, currency is the most liquid form. And then next, money in your checking account. There is no restrictions on getting the money out of your regular checking account. I'm not talking about a money market mutual fund or a money market demand deposit that will have um, restrictions on you getting the money from your account. I'm talking about a plain old-fashioned checking account. You can empty that checking account if you want to. If you go to the bank today, you can ask for the money out of it. It is very accessible to you. You may not realize that that's not true for your savings account. Money in your savings account is not as liquid because there are restrictions against it. If you have $20,000 in your savings account and you go to the bank and you say, I want all $20,000 out and I don't have to give it to you because when you open that savings account, you signed a form that acknowledged that they could have up to, and each institution is different, but maybe 10 days to get that money to you. They probably won't. As best as they're able, they're going to meet your request for your money, but they may not have $20,000 on site on any given day. 
in which case they will tell you that they will deposit that in your checking account in X number of days when they would have it. So M2 money is a broader definition of money. M2 is everything in M1 and some more stuff. So now those money market demand deposit accounts um, that have restrictions on your checking account, like you can only write three checks a month or you have to have a minimum $5,000 balance, whatever it is. Those are now counted in M2. Uh, your savings account would be counted in M2. When they say time deposits, they're talking about certificates of deposits, CDs. Those are counted in M2 if they're small. Um, so M2 is just a broader definition of money. It's everything in M1 plus other stuff. You don't need to know what the other stuff is. You just need to know that M1 is currency and money in your checking account. You have to know that all the time. And then you need to know that M2 is a bigger definition, a broader definition of money. Everything in M1 plus some other stuff. So this graphic just gives you a picture that the kind of money that we're talking about, M1, it just fits in that little green section of that overall big circle. So currency, checkable deposits, you don't need to know that it's 43%, 57%. That varies from year to year and time to time. So it isn't important that you know the total dollar value. It's important that you know that M1 is a very narrow definition of money. It's just currency and checkable deposits. That's what we're going to talk about. And the whole pie of money is much larger than that. So when we think about what backs the money supply, in the olden days, like in the mid-1900s, we moved away from gold backing the money supply. Used to, there was enough gold in Fort Knox to back every dollar in the money supply. But the economy grows and grows and grows, and there's just simply not enough gold in Fort Knox to back our money supply. That ceased to be a thing. So now there really isn't anything backing our money supply. So this guaranteed by government's ability to keep value stable. Our money is really only backed by your belief that the federal government will have responsible fiscal policies and monetary policies to keep the value of the dollar stable. It's really just our belief that they can do that. So money is a debt. It's a debt of the Federal Reserve. If you pull out a dollar bill across the top, you'll see that it says Federal Reserve debt, debt, a debt of the Federal Reserve. It's valuable because when we want to buy something, we know that the vendor we want to buy it from will accept our dollars. It's also considered legal tender, which means that there is provision in the United States laws that says if you owe a debt, it can always be paid by U.S. currency. So other companies might accept other currencies. Um, on the northwest side of Fort Worth, we have a lot of businesses that accept pesos, and that's just fine. There's no problem with that, the Mexican peso. But they also have to accept the U.S. dollar. They can't refuse to accept it. And then money's valuable because it's relatively scarce. You know, you've heard your parents say, money doesn't grow on trees. Okay, yeah, that's something our parents used to always say. They're just saying it's scarce, it's hard to get, so we have to be careful with how we spend it. If money literally grew on trees and it wasn't scarce, it also wouldn't have any value. The price system then begins to allocate goods and services amongst those who have the money to pay for them. So the prices of goods and services affect the purchasing power of our money. So let's think about inflation going up, prices going up, 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 up. If the amount of currency we have stays the same, but prices go up, can you see that you can't buy as much as you could have before that inflation? And we've looked at what hyperinflation looks like in other countries. <coughs> Excuse me. So hyperinflation is just that um, inflation going up, 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 not measured in terms of 10%, maybe measured in terms of 100 or 500 or 1,000 or a million. And, and we saw countries um, in Chapter 9 where they had billions of percent inflation. So when that happens, the purchasing power of the money erodes down to nothing. 
So it's really important that we believe that our nation will have intelligent management of our money supply and appropriate fiscal policy. Remember, we studied fiscal policy, government spending and taxes in chapter nine in order to keep the value of the money stable. So the Federal Reserve is our nation's bank. All developed countries have a central banking authority. They don't all call them a Federal Reserve, although there are a few nations that do. They're usually called the Bank of, like the Bank of Japan or the Bank of Mexico. That's, that's the typical way to refer to the uh, central bank for a country. But we tried that. You remember the whole Jefferson Hamilton debate thing, if you've ever listened to the musical. And so trying to set up the first national bank and then not renewing that charter for that bank and then tried again with the second and that charter also didn't get renewed. And so in 1913, when they tried one more time to set up a central bank, this time it stuck, but we didn't want the third national bank. So they just changed the name to Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve is our nation's central bank. The way that it's set up is with a board of governors. So we have seven members on the board of governors. They are appointed by the president. I need you to know that they're not elected. It's very important that they not be elected. They are appointed by the president. They're appointed for 14 year terms. That's a really long term, right? Longer than any sitting president could be in the office. And then I think I said, but let me make sure that you know that 1913 is the date you're gonna see in your textbook for the beginning of the Federal Reserve. So let's keep looking. So this chart gives us the Board of Governors at the top. How many did we say it was on there? Well, we said that there were seven Board of Governors. So let's put a, whoops, I didn't get my pen. Let me try again. I think I turned it off instead of turning it on. So there are seven Board of Governors. Remember, they're appointed, A-P-P-T. They're appointed by the president and they serve for 14 year terms. I want you to know that. All right, a subset of the Board of Governors is this Federal Open Market Committee. We'll get to that in just a second. Let's do the 12 Federal Reserve Banks first. So the 12 Federal Reserve Banks are scattered across the nation. You'll see it on the next slide where, they're, where they are. You'll notice that most of them are on the East Coast because in 1913 when we set it up, that's where everybody lived. But we have Federal Reserve Banks that do the banking business across the nation. Each of these banks has a president. The president of the Federal Reserve Banks are hired by the Board of Governors. So these people are regular employees. They're hired by the Board of Governors. So there's 12 of them because there's 12 Federal Reserve Banks. All right. Then we have our Federal Open Market Committee. So the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, is in charge of increasing and decreasing the money supply by buying and selling government bonds. Open Market Committee, buying and selling government bonds. So there are 12 people on the Federal Open Market Committee. Seven of them are the Board of Governors. Board of Governors. And that leaves five. And of these remaining five, they rotate from these presidents. So five of these presidents sit on the Open Market Committee at any one time and they rotate on and off. So those 12 Federal Reserve Banks control our, our commercial banking system, whether it's a, a regular national bank or if it's a savings and loan or a credit union. The Federal Reserve Banks has authority over both. There are additional authorities over the thrift institutions. We're not gonna talk about that, but they have another layer of government. And then those people, the commercial banks and the thrift institutions are then handling our money with our checking accounts and other services that they provide. This is the graphic we looked at. I told you that most of the Federal Reserve Banks are on the East Coast because that's where everybody lived in 1913 when this was set up and it's never been redistricted. Instead, we have some 
branches of each of these district banks, but we're just going to talk about the 12 district banks. But you can see that the San Francisco one covers a large area, and so there are some banks set up to serve as um, branch banks to help that particular district. So the Federal Open Market Committee is helping the Board of Governors, remember all the Board of Governors were on the FOMC in addition to five of the bank presidents, but they're helping to decide what the monetary policy is going to be and they're going to conduct the open market operations. So when we think about what open market operations are, I need you to remember that open market operations is buying and selling government bonds. So we're going to find out a lot about this in the coming chapters because it's actually very important. So when the federal government buys government bonds, it can increase the money supply. And when they sell government bonds, it can decrease the money supply. And all of that is carried out inside the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve will buy or sell bonds in order to increase or decrease the money supply. I just like this graphic because sometimes we think we're in the United States are really, you know, just the center of all the financial doings in the world, and we're just really not. So the largest financial institution is located in China. So is the second largest. So is the third largest. I mean, we really have to come down a bit before we get a large financial institution in the United States. And then we have, um, I guess it's four here. So we have some large financial institutions, but we are not the largest. We need, to, we need to be a little more aware of where we fit in the whole global picture. So now we have functions of the Federal Reserve. You need to know all of them because you're going to use all of them in the coming chapters. So perhaps you've been to the Mint in Fort Worth. Maybe you did it as I don't know, a field trip from some educational institution. They print the money, but it is the Federal Reserve's function to actually send that money out into circulation. So the Federal Reserve will decide how much money goes out into circulation. That's their, uh, fun it's one of their functions. So set the reserve requirement is a new concept for most of us. Most of us haven't thought about what that means, setting the reserve requirement. So when we invest, well not when we invest, that's the wrong term, when we deposit, think that, when we deposit money in our checking account, we should not be thinking that the uh, bank is just letting that money sit, waiting for us to need it. So when we deposit money, banks use our money to make money. So the Federal Reserve sets a percentage of the deposits that the banks must keep. A percentage of the deposit that the banks must keep is the reserve requirement. And it's the Federal Reserve's function to set that. So I'm trying to write must keep. Do you notice that when I really get to writing, I have to stop topping, talking? All right, so you're going to apply that reserve requirement to the checkable deposits that the bank is holding, and you will be calculating the bank's required reserves when you do that. We always want to know that a bank can meet its required reserves. Once a bank can meet its required reserves, then it can use the rest of the money that it has to make loans or buy securities or real estate or whatever they want to do to make a profit. So the reserve requirement is setting the percentage of the bank's deposits that they must keep on hand. They can't loan out or use that to make a profit. If the banks cannot meet the reserve requirement set by the Fed, then that very day, they have to get a loan either from another bank or from the Federal Reserve to meet that required reserves. They can't say, oh, we'll do better tomorrow. No, that's not an option. 
Every single day, the banks have to be able to meet their required reserves. They would prefer to get a loan, an over, they're called overnight loans, from another bank, but if there's not another bank that has excess reserves to loan them, then they'll have to go to the Federal Reserve to get that loan. So the Federal Reserve acts as the lender of, la lender of last resort to banks if they can't meet those required reserves. So the Federal Reserve does lend money to banks. They just usually are the lender of last resort. Now I'm guessing that most of you don't write checks anymore. That's really just a, a phenomenon that's going to disappear over time. I find that about the only checks I write in a given month are to people that I haven't set up Zelle accounts with, like the guy that comes to cut the grass just prefers if I leave a check out for him rather than cash that might disappear or setting up the Zelle account. So I still write a couple of checks a month, maybe, but not much. When checks are written, they are cleared through the Federal Reserve. So in the next chapter, you're gonna be learning the process of how when you write down an amount on a piece of paper, how it comes out of your account and goes into the other person's account. That function of making that happen is um, one of the functions of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is also the bank for the United States government. So when you get your tax return check or whatever benefits you might get from the government, if you receive money from the government, it's going to be written off of one of the Federal Reserve banks. The Federal Reserve supervises banks. We saw that while ago in that org chart. So they set the requirements and the regulations and they are charged with making sure that the banks are conducting business in a responsible manner. But here's the most important one. If you're asked what's the most important function of the Federal Reserve, it's control the money supply. So you wanna put that in big bold letters. From time to time, you'll hear legislation come up in Congress where somebody is proposing that the federal, the administration of the Federal Reserve come under Congress instead of the Board of Governors. That's a really bad idea. I try never to give you personal opinions in, an, in my economics classes. I want to help you think from an economic perspective, but I don't want to tell you what to think. But it's actually very important that the Federal Reserve stay an independent agency. It was established that way by Congress in order to be protected from any political pressure. Historically, globally, all around the world, when the legislative authority has taken over the monetary responsibilities, there's been a significant negative effect and usually a monetary collapse. Those two branches of government need to stay separate. So the Federal Reserve is very isolated from political pressure. I told you they were appointed, they're not elected. And you think, well, they're still uh, responsible then to the president that, president that appointed them, but that's not true because their terms are for 14 years. They're going to outlast any president that appointed them. And if they want to be reappointed, it'll be a different president, maybe a different party in power at the time. The Board of Governors, if you study the makeup of them, they are not politicians. They are economists. They many times have a legal background, but they are always focused on the economy. They are not focused on any sort of political agenda other than just stabilizing the economy. I know we've talked a lot about the Great Recession, and here it comes up again at the end of this chapter. And they begin to, to analyze it from a monetary perspective. So in 2007, 8, 9, we sink into this Great Depression. What caused it? Well, it was at least precipitated by the mortgage default crisis. We had big lenders making some pretty iffy loans and then combining them with some stronger loans and big uh, big mortgage-backed securities. They felt like that would give stability if they combine the, the risky loans with the more um, or the less risky loans. 
But then when everything began to fall, when those loans began to default, it took it down like a house of cards and it just went from bad to worse. And so the Federal Reserve did step in and provide a lot of assistance and relief that to this day, people aren't sure they really should have done for the Federal Reserve to step in and save some of these big financial institutions by making huge loans and grants to them. But if we hadn't, we would have had significant effect in the overall economy. So this was, at least from the Federal Reserve's perspective, a way to keep this mortgage default crisis from spiraling even further to take down our economy much more than it actually did. When that happens, when the Fed steps in and saves those big companies and keeps them from going under, acts as that lender of last resort, not just to the banks, but to other large financial institutions, it increases the moral hazard. So let's think about what that means for just a minute. If you know you are totally responsible for your decisions and no one's going to bail you out, then you take your decisions a little more seriously. If you didn't have any insurance on your home or your car, you'd make different decisions than when you have insurance and you know that if it burns to the ground or whatever might happen to your car, an insurance company is going to take care of it. That creates a moral hazard. We don't behave as responsibly as we would if we knew no one was going to bail us out. And so the Fed bailing out some of those large financial institutions set up that moral hazard problem. Do the, do the um, really large lenders have to be as responsible with their loans if they know that the Fed could potentially bail them out? It might have set a bad precedent for the future.